trying to end the Gulf dispute. First a breakthrough, then a setback, as Qatari and Saudi Arabia leaders talked for the first time on ending the blockade. Within minutes, more talks were put on hold. What went wrong and is dialogue still possible? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashim Ahl Barra. It was their first phone call since diplomatic relations were cut and a land, sea and air blockade imposed more than three months ago. The Emir of Qatar and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia talked by phone on Friday. But hopes of a breakthrough were quickly put on hold and more talks suspended, apparently because of a dispute about protocol. The setback followed Donald Trump's offer to help end the crisis. We'll hear from our expert guests soon, but first our White House correspondent, Kimberly Halkett, reports. Tremendous optimism over the fact that the White House had successfully coordinated the first official contact since this rift between GCC partners erupted, the rift that has now been in place for many, many months, this phone call that has taken place between the Emir of Qatar and the Saudi Crown Prince. But what happened after that phone call seems to be what has caused so much consternation. The fact that there is an accusation by Saudi Arabia that, in fact, the Qatar's news agency misrepresented the facts, failing to, in the eyes of the Saudis, uh, report that it was the Emir of Qatar that initiated the phone call to Saudi Arabia's crown prince. This has led to accusations, in fact, that uh, Qatar has misrepresented the facts of the phone call, the facts about any sort of dialogue, not serious about dialogue, and even, in fact, that there is concern on the part of Saudi Arabia that their Qatar will continue its so-called previous policies. Now, we know that Qatar on Thursday reiterated that when it comes to the list of the 13 demands, what is not negotiable is any sort of discussion on the infringement of Qatar's sovereignty or of freedom of speech. This has been well received in terms of uh, the mediator in these discussions, the Emir of Kuwait saying that not all 13 demands will be acceptable. Uh, and it seemed that in fact there was a glimmer of hope that things were moving forward. But now as a result of the accusation by Saudi Arabia that Qatar has misrepresented the uh, how this phone call came about between the Emir of Qatar and the Saudi Crown Prince, that now there is a doubling down of defiance that there will be no further talks. Let's now get the thoughts of our guests. Joining us on the panel here in Doha, Abdullah Babu, director of the Gulf Studies Center at Qatar University. In London, we have Andreas Craig, assistant professor at the Defense Studies Department, King's College. But let's first talk to Mohammed Jaham Al Kawari, Qatar's ambassador to Spain. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Ambassador, for joining us. Let me ask you this. We had the phone conversation between the Emir of Qatar and Saudi Arabia's uh, crown prince. And then suddenly, minutes later, Saudi Arabia is saying that it's suspending talks with Qatar. Can you give us an idea about what's going on here? Well, it was a very positive conversation. And... Uh... Thanks to the initiative of Kuwait and the efforts of uh, President Trump, and uh, later on, I, you know, we have to inform our public opinion of what happened. And there was a declaration uh, uh, in our uh, news agency. And I think uh, later on, uh, unfortunately, there was some uh, um, declaration from the Saudi party. Mm -hmm. But uh, we understand that this is we are living in a crisis. And usually on this kind of situation, there is ups and downs. And the most important thing, we want to see uh, good intentions from uh, our uh, brothers and uh, other GCC countries mm -hmm. to see that they are willing to find an end for this crisis. Ambassador Kawari, the phone conversation is still seen by many as a move forward. This is the first time leaders from Qatar and Saudi Arabia talk since the start of the crisis on the 5th 
of June. Are you confident we might see some breakthrough in the near future? Uh, uh, we are confident in the initiative of uh, Amir of Kuwait because he's uh, exerting a lot of effort and uh, putting a lot of time. And uh, the same time we see from the other side, there is uh, uh, American effort and the international community want to see an end for this uh, this uh, this crisis because it's not uh, serving the interests of any any country or any party, and uh, we are we have hope that uh, our brothers in the GCC will <laughs> understand. You know, this is the time to uh, to come down and sit down around the table and negotiate because this is the only thing. And Qatar said this in the first day, and uh, uh, anything they want to uh, discuss, we are ready to discuss except uh, the things which is uh, violating our sovereignty. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ambassador, we, uh, th th there are some scheduled uh, meetings in New York uh, uh, as the United Nations is bracing for the uh, General Assembly meeting. Do you expect some sort of uh, uh, rapprochement between the GCC leaders the moment they, con uh, they convene there? Now, what was wrong uh, is necessary, I think, and in the end, uh, all of us, we have to be uh, negotiating and sitting uh, on the same table, and uh, because this is, this is a, an issue that's affecting uh, uh, the interests of the whole countries in the region and the whole countries in the world, and mm -hmm. I think... Uh, uh, we are uh, in Qatar uh, open for this uh, dialogue and we want to see an end because it's, it's important to see um, this escalation of uh, campaign against Qatar to, to be ended because what they are doing now is uh, in, uh, no, one, no one was believing that we will reach this point. And uh, uh, we are in the uh, same organization, which is the GCC uh, 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 organization, and we have to, 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 to work uh, to develop our region instead of uh, getting in this kind of situation and uh, creating mm -hmm. a lot of crisis and conflict. Ambassador Mohammed uh, Jaham uh, Abdel Aziz Al Kawari, Qatar's ambassador to Spain. Thank you very much indeed for your time. Thank you. Let's now go back to our guests, uh, Dr. Abdullah Ba'boud and uh, in Doha and Andreas Craig in London. Let me start by asking you this, Mr. Ba'boud. So within a few minutes, there was a sense of breakthrough in the region and then a major setback. Do you think this is just a squabble over protocol or there are different deeper layers to this conflict? Uh, I, I think the blockading countries were not really intending to uh, negotiate. Uh, they want to prolong this for, for uh, at least some time. Um, they haven't uh, uh, achieved anything from this blockade uh, to uh, bring them back to the table. Uh, and I think they are embarrassed. However, they were pressurized, in my opinion, by the public opinion, by international uh, uh, consensus, but also by the call from uh, president, uh, uh, the President of the United States. Uh, and I think following that, that call uh, from Trump, um, uh, the uh, call took place. Uh, I, I think they were just looking for any pretext to delay it. Uh, and we have to remember that it's not just one country. There are four countries that are blockading. Uh, and I think there are also some differences between uh, the, uh, the other three countries <laughs> because the Crown Prince said that he was going to consult with them. I think that the, the, the protocol or what was said or reported uh, on the national agency, news agency, I don't think that uh, should be used as a pretext to stop uh, what is going to be an important talk to resolve this mm -hmm. crisis and this conflict in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, Sir Craig, what, what's your take on what happened yesterday? I, I agree with uh, what Abdullah just said. I mean, this is a clash over narratives, and I think yesterday we've seen for the first time that this clash over narrative actually takes precedence over actual diplomacy. And, um, you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've seen this entire spiral of narratives and counter-narratives kind of spiral, spiraling out of control. 
And um, what happened yesterday um, was a very minor issue, I think. Who called whom didn't really matter because it's actually very important that they actually started talking. It, didn't matter, it doesn't matter who made the first call. Um, but there are forces within Saudi Arabia who are not interested in bringing this to an end very quickly. And these forces might not be Mohammed bin Salman himself, but there are certain people around him. Most importantly, I think Mr. Kahtani, who is in charge of uh, um, government communication, who was very quick to denounce the Qatar National News Agency report. And it kind of shows that the Saudis, especially Mohammed bin Salman, now are in a, in, in a place of um, an inferiority complex. Um, they need to show that they are strong and they need to show that they're winning. And they're looking for a face-saving measure to get out of this conflict. Uh, and it obviously shows for them, in their eyes, shows weakness that he made the first initiative to call the emir. But it didn't really matter. So and I think this is, this is, I think, the key problem here is that we are now so much bogged down, so deeply bogged down in this clash over narratives that real diplomacy, real facts, and real interests don't really matter anymore. Mm -hmm. There's this issue of, uh, Mr. Babu, there's this issue of the domestic considerations which uh, Craig was referring to. But also people are talking about the, the, the differences between the key players among the quartet, many believe that ultimately it's the United Arab Emirates that calls the final shot. And therefore, if they're not on board, there's absolutely no way this whole crisis will come to an end. Yeah, I think the United Arab Emirates is uh, definitely a key player uh, in, in this uh, conflict, um, uh, along with Saudi Arabia, I think Bahrain and uh, Egypt. Um, have different reasons to be there, but they, they don't necessarily, uh, uh, they're not necessarily playing uh, a very major role uh, in this. Um, so uh, there was, there were people asked saying that perhaps Mohammed bin uh, Salman, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, called uh, uh, the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates, and perhaps there was the disagreement there. Um, uh, there is definitely uh, a clash of uh, narratives, as Andrea said, but also there is a clash of interest here. Qatar is a growing country, it's a developing country, it's, um, it's competing in some ways with the United Arab Emirates. And I think the in the United Arab Emirates, they want to see that Qatar does not compete with them, and they want to keep it down. Uh, unfortunately, this is not something that can be achieved through this blockade. It doesn't help anybody. Uh, it, it really goes against uh, the uh, uh, the conscious of the people here mm -hmm. who want to work together, they want to collaborate, they want to see the region developing together. A little competition is always very healthy. However, I think between uh, Qatar and the Emirates, there is this competition that mm -hmm. perhaps leads the United Arab Emirates to follow this. Mr. Craig, this the, the phone call... Um, uh, came after Trump said that his U.S. President Donald Trump said his, uh, that he was willing to mediate. Do you think that the Americans now are stepping in and playing a bigger role in this crisis? It would be great to see if the, to see the Americans taking more responsibility in this crisis because it's their interests which are at stake as well. Um, we've seen already since uh, Tillerson came to the region more than two months ago or around two months ago that the Americans are willing to boost uh, the Kuwaiti position and the Kuwaiti mediation effort, and they've, they've really done that. It has been quite counterproductive that the White House wasn't on the same page as the State Department and mm -hmm. the Defense Department, but it seems now that they have convinced Trump that this is the right way forward, and I think Trump did a good thing in stepping forward and making these phone calls and trying to bring people on the, uh, uh, to the table. Issue being that Trump doesn't have the kind of uh, legitimacy and credibility that someone like the Emir of Kuwait might have because he doesn't understand the relationships at play. Um, um, but on the other hand, he's still the president of the United States and mm -hmm. uh, the country that everybody in the GCC looks towards as a protector. And that means he has a lot of leverage. And I think the Americans put, can put pressure that Kuwait in its current role within the GCC cannot mm -hmm. really play because in, the, the Kuwaiti mediation effort is one that is very much focused on the mm -hmm. position, personal position and relationships of the Emir. For you, Mr. Babu, it was quite also interesting that President Trump now, his statements are now more balanced than before when it comes to the GCC crisis. His last statement was saying that, asking all the countries to follow through on the commitments of the Riyadh summit when it comes to defeating terrorism and cutting off funding for terrorist groups. What can the Americans do in practical terms to de-escalate the tension? 
Well, I, I think the Americans actually played a very important role initially in escalating the tension, uh, especially uh, uh, President Trump uh, and his tweets and, uh, uh, and, uh, and his uh, media uh, talks that he was blaming Qatar for, uh, for the crisis. Um, but I think over time, the, uh, uh, the foreign uh, ministry of foreign affairs or, uh, and the ministry of defense uh, and the players who are uh, and who understand the region, especially uh, uh, Tillerson and uh, uh, the, uh, the Ministry of Defense uh, Martinson. Secretary, uh, Madison, they, uh, they have, I think they have brought him back to understand that uh, there are intricacies here in the region and he shouldn't do uh, and say the things that he's been saying. Now what, and I think that he's now becoming very uh, moderate in his, uh, in his uh, tweets and, and in his talks. He's also facing a lot of problems internally, uh, domestically. There are a lot of issues that he needs to face, uh, but also globally, uh, uh, as a leader of the, uh, the global uh, leader, uh, uh, he's facing issues with Korea, he's facing issues with North Korea, I meant, and uh, he's so facing issues with uh, mm -hmm. Russia and so on, and Iran. And he does not need another problem here in the Gulf states, you know, let alone the, the, the issues with uh, fighting uh, terrorism. Mm -hmm. So he needs to solve an, this one, to as, solve as, this as one out. And, okay. and there is a very important role that he can play mm -hmm. if yeah. he wanted to do so. Uh, Mr. Craig, I think the only place, ideally, the only place where you can have everyone come together is basically the United New York, where there's going to be the United Nations General Assembly meetings. Do you think that could be the ideal platform to bring together all the different countries to set aside their differences and negotiate a settlement? Ideally, I think the UN should, should play a big role in this. But I think similar, these international organizations in this dispute is similar to the GCC. I think the UN is a toothless tiger. It's very much a, a, a giant that doesn't really function well. Um, the fact that we that naturally the GCC countries should go towards their institution, which is the Gulf Cooperation Council, and try to solve it there, um, it, you know, the, the sign that the fact that they didn't do this shows that they're not really believing in international organizations. And I think because this is not a dispute really just about interests, it's about narratives, it's about personal relationships, and that goes a lot deeper than just 2017, a lot deeper than the last Gulf crisis, 2014. Um, I think. What we need is a mediation effort, and I think the Americans have understood that this is the way forward. Tillerson, when he was in Doha, made it clear that you know, they will concentrate now on trying to find a way out with the Saudis and the Qataris and leaving out the United Arab Emirates for the time being, because the UAE have more at stake here in terms of, you know, they have more interest involved in keeping this going. The Saudis don't have an interest in keeping this going. And quite on the contrary, Mohammed bin Salman mm -hmm. needs to find a way out of this crisis that is face saving. Um, and I think the, the way out will be a solution eventually whereby Saudi Arabia will find a way to talk to the countries and then present it as Mohammed bin Salman is the one who solved the crisis. I mean, you know, he's probably going to be king very soon. And it would be a great way of introducing him as the hero who solved the Gulf crisis. Because a lot of the stuff that Mohammed bin Salman has going on domestically, which is the Yemen war, you know, the, the Agenda 2030, these issues um, have all been disasters for him. I mean, he hasn't mm -hmm. really been able to score any victories. So no. if he can go and... Um, show that he's the, the, the hero of that crisis. I think that would work well for him domestically. Well, speaking of the way out, uh, Mr. Babud, we're talking about a list of 13 demands that were presented by the blockading countries. They, they still insist that these are uh, prerequisites for any settlement. Qatar, on the other hand, says that those demands are infringe its sovereignty. How can they uh, make concessions about this? I think it's difficult to go to the negotiating table with uh, a list, uh, with a prerequisite, uh, with a list of demands. And Qatar, uh, especially those list of demands that are, that are particularly made not to be accepted. Uh, and uh, uh, they, as they do in French, on uh, the sovereignty uh, of the states and the legit legitimacy of the ruler. So uh, I think um, if there was going to be a way out, and I believe that there is going to be a negotiated settlement, that's the only way uh, out of this crisis, is to go without any demands and uh, to go to the table and go back to the previous agreement that was uh, uh, signed in 2013 and 2014 and start from there 
uh, as, as a basis that you can build on. Uh, anything that they want to discuss, I believe Qatar is ready to, to negotiate and to discuss uh, about them. They have no worry in Qatar, as the Emir had already uh, mentioned, uh, that they will open all the, uh, the, the, you know, the books and they can discuss anything that mm -hmm. they wanted. However, don't come with your demands and tell me, you know, this is what you have to do and you have to agree them Take before the negotiation. So what do we go there to negotiate for? Mm -hmm. I think there has to be a change of mind, a change of perception of how this is going to play. And I think Qatar is ready to negotiate and okay. willing to negotiate. Mr. Craig, I mean, the crisis has been described as unprecedented, a blockade, uh, described by many as amounting to a declaration of war against Qatar. Do you believe that even if this is solved in the near future, the old political order in this part of the world will continue to be the same? I don't think so. I think this was, it's a, it, it will push people, <clears throat> um, and it has pushed people already across the edge. This is the first time this is not just a dispute over, um, over, uh, over between different uh, governments, but it's, it's been as well as, you know, it's been very much a conflict between people as well. And with social media involved and the media and with alternative facts involved, We've seen a lot of the people being dragged into this as well. And there has been a humanitarian cost as well on the, on the country side. You know, families being, uh, for the first time, really being separated. Or e even though they, they have the same tribe, they can't really see each other. These things will have an impact for ge on, on, the men on the psyche of uh, Khaliji people, of Gulf people for the generations to come, I think. And I think the longer this stays, this blockade stays in place and Qatar will continue to build alternative routes out of this towards East Asia, towards Turkey, Iran, the more the GCC becomes obsolete and the more the Gulf as a security complex as such becomes obsolete. And I, I'm very pessimistic that things will ever go back to, uh, to how it was before. Also for one reason, Saudi, the GCC was founded by, this, by Saudi Arabia in a completely different environment where Saudi was really the leading country in this part of the world. Now, um, the Gulf has changed. You have the UAE, who is very powerful with their own ambitions. You have Qatar with its own ambitions, looking forward. And so it's, it's a lot more primos inter pares. Saudi is one of the leaders among many. And I think the GCC mm -hmm. has to be completely reconceptualized in order to move forward. As it is now, I don't think it can continue to exist. Is the crisis going, Mr. Babu, going to further consolidate the GCC or disintegrate the GCC? Or do you see any regional realignments in the near, near future here? Well, if the crisis continues and prolong for, prolong for, uh, for a time, I think, uh, as, as Andres was saying, we're going to see uh, a realignment which is already taking place, where we can see that Qatar has started to open routes, open uh, a relationship with uh, Turkey, with Iran, but also with uh, far beyond South Asia, etc. And also, there are other GCC countries that would start to think, when are we going to be less on the next, uh, next on the list for, for, for being blockaded, for uh, if we disagree or if we make any uh, policy that, uh, that they don't like uh, in Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates. So I think the, the wounds that this crisis is going to leave are going to be really deep, not only in Qatar, but also among the people uh, in other uh, GCC states. I think the trust has now been lost. Mm -hmm. To regain that, it will require a lot of time, uh, but also it will require that this conflict is resolved as quickly as possible before the wounds become uh, too deep and uh, too difficult to, uh, to repair. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the region does not require further I disintegration mm -hmm. and doesn't require further uh, crisis. As we know, you know, the, we, we're, we are surrounded by conflicts around us. Speaking of the conflicts, let me go to uh, Craig. Craig, in less than half a minute, do you expect countries like Iran and Turkey to play bigger role in the region because of the divisions among GCC countries? Um, absolutely. I think a, a weak GCC, as Abdullah said, will always strengthen Iran. I mean, a weak GCC will be definitely playing into the hands of Iran as the other bigger power. And as a, a weak GCC will undermine the power of Saudi Arabia. It is in Saudi Arabia's interest to actually unite the GCC in order to maintain their position in the region. And I definitely think that Iran will go out of this crisis as strengthened. Andreas Craig, Abdullah Babu, thank you very much indeed for your time.
And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. For further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahlbar and the whole team here. Bye for now.